Good evening. On behalf of the faculty and staff at the Friedrich von Junst Library of Forgotten Worlds in Dusseldorf, welcome, and thank you for listening to tonight's broadcast. My name is Lecter Finn J.D. John, Master Curator at the von Junst Library's Corvallis Branch. It is good to have you with us tonight. Tonight, we will be reading Chapter 11 of A Princess of Mars by Edgar Rice Burroughs, the 1912 documentary of Mr. Burroughs' uncle, John Carter of Mars. But first, I have an update for you on our forthcoming project, the library's new dreaming room. I am delighted to announce that we have a name for it. It is to be called the Randolph Carter Memorial Dreaming Room. The Council of Prefects has agreed that the Dreaming Room will be a long, dimly lit space, subterranean, with low ceilings, illuminated only by Chinese lamps. There will be no windows. Along each side will be a row of low bunks with small tables close to each, each equipped with a small, alcohol-fueled lamp. Now. The more worldly among you might be suggesting just now that that sounds rather like an opium den. Such similarity is, of course, entirely coincidental. This brings us to another bothersome question which the thirteen prefects have asked that I look into, that of funding. They estimate that we will need a total of 25 million Kulsh marks. To those of us here in the New World, that's about twelve million dollars. They have asked me to look into the possibility of launching a Kickstarter campaign to raise the uh, necessary lettuce, as Lector Steve Costigan likes to call it. My inquiries into this possibility revealed that one is encouraged to make a video pitch to upload on the Kickstarter website. I am already making my plans for a video pitch that will encourage generous philanthropists and foolish spendthrifts alike to dig deep and pledge a generous contribution for the expansion of the only transtemporal library of forgotten cryptical and occult learning in the world. Lecter Costigan has suggested that I should make a special appeal to all you lottery winners and other temporarily pecunious spendthrifts out there with the following special offer. For a pledge of 3,000 Kulsh marks or more, we will present you with one of the broken bricks left over from the destruction of the library by the small boy Euston, who may or may not be me, many years ago. However, if you will act now, today, during our Thonbuster drive, that brick can be yours for just 5,000 Kulsh marks. I'll leave you to rummage in the seat cushions for gold pieces to contribute to this worthy cause, and in the meantime, let us turn to our reading for today, Chapter 11 of Edgar Rice Burroughs' account of the extraordinary experiences of his uncle, John Carter, on the planet Mars. Let us begin. Chapter 11 With Deja Thoris as we reached the open, the two female guards who had been detailed to watch over Deja Thoris hurried up and made as though to assume custody of her once more. The poor child shrank against me, and I felt her two little hands fold tightly over my arm. Waving the women away, I informed them that Sola would attend the captive hereafter, and I further warned Sarkocha that any more of her cruel attentions bestowed upon Deja Thoris would result in Sarkocha's sudden and painful demise. My threat was unfortunate, and resulted in more harm than good to Deja Thoris, for as I learned later, men do not kill women upon Mars, nor women men. So Sarkocha merely gave us an ugly look, and departed to hatch up deviltries against us. I soon found Sola, and explained to her that I wished for her to guard Deja Thoris as she had guarded me, that I wished her to find other quarters where they would not be molested by Sarkocha, and I finally informed her that I myself would take up my quarters among the men. Sola glanced at the accouterments which were carried in my hand and slung across my shoulder. You are a great chieftain now, John Carter, she said, and I must do your bidding, though indeed I am glad to do it under any circumstances. The man whose medal you carry was young, but he was a great warrior, and he had by his promotions and kills won his way close to the rank of Tars Tarkas, who, as you know, is second to Lorquas Potomo only. You are eleventh. There are but ten chieftains in this community who rank you in prowess. And if I should kill Lorquas Potomo? I asked. 
you would be first, John Carter, but you may only win that honor by the will of the entire council that Lorquist Potomal meet you in combat. Or should he attack you, you may kill him in self-defense and thus win first place. I laughed and changed the subject. I had no particular desire to kill Lorquist Potomal and less to be a Jed among the Tharks. I accompanied Sola and Deja Thoris in a search for new quarters, which we found in a building nearer the audience chamber and of far more pretentious architecture than our former habitation. We also found in this building real sleeping apartments with ancient beds of highly wrought metal swinging from enormous gold chains depending from the marble ceilings. The decoration of the walls was most elaborate, and unlike the frescoes in the other buildings I had examined, portrayed many human figures in the compositions. They were of people like myself, and of a much lighter color than Deja Thoris. They were clad in graceful flowing robes, highly ornamented with metal and jewels, and their luxurious hair was of a beautiful golden and reddish bronze. The men were beardless, and only a few wore arms. The scenes depicted for the most part a fair-skinned, fair-haired people at play. Deja Thoris clasped her hands with an exclamation of rapture as she gazed upon these magnificent works of art wrought by a people long extinct, while Sola, on the other hand, apparently did not see them. We decided to use this room on the second floor and overlooking the plaza for Deja Thoris and Sola, and another room adjoining and in the rear for cooking and supplies. I then dispatched Sola to bring the bedding and such food and utensils as she might need, telling her that I would guard Deja Thoris until her return. As Sola departed, Deja Thoris turned to me with a faint smile. And where to, then, would your prisoner escape should you leave her, unless it was to follow you and crave your protection and ask your pardon for the cruel thoughts she has harbored against you these past few days? You are right, I answered. There is no escape for either of us unless we go together. I heard your challenge to the creature you call Tars Tarkas, and I think I understand your position among these people, but what I cannot fathom is your statement that you are not of Barsoom. In the name of my first ancestor, then, she continued, where may you be from? You are like unto my people, and yet so unlike. You speak my language, yet I heard you tell Tars Tarkas that you had but learned it recently. All Barsoomians speak the same tongue, from the ice-clad south to the ice-clad north, though their written languages differ. Only in the Valley Dor, where the river Is empties into the Lost Sea of Corsus, is there supposed to be a different language spoken, and except in the legends of our ancestors, there is no record of a Barsoomian returning up the river Is from the shores of Corsus in the Valley of Dor. Do not tell me that you have thus returned. They would kill you horribly anywhere upon the surface of Barsoom if that were true. Tell me it is not. Her eyes filled with a strange, weird light, her voice was pleading, and her little hands reaching up to my breast were pressed against me as though to wring a denial from my very heart. I do not know your customs, Deja Thoris, I said, but in my own Virginia a gentleman does not lie to save himself. I am not of door. I have never seen the mysterious Is. The lost sea of Corsus is still lost as far as I am concerned. Do you believe me? And then it struck me suddenly that I was very anxious that she should believe me. It was not that I feared the results that would follow a general belief that I had returned from the Barsoomian heaven or hell or whatever it was. Why was it then? Why should I care what she thought? I looked down at her, her beautiful face upturned and her wonderful eyes opening up the very depths of her soul, and as my eyes met hers I knew why. And I shuddered. A similar wave of feeling seemed to stir her. She drew away from me with a sigh, and with her earnest, beautiful face turned up to mine, she whispered, I believe you, John Carter. I do not know what a gentleman is, nor have I ever heard before of Virginia, but on Barsoom no man lies, and if he does not wish to speak the truth, he is silent. Where is this Virginia, your country, John Carter? And it seemed that fair name of my fair land had never sounded more beautiful than as it fell from those perfect lips on that far-gone day. I am of another world, I answered, the great planet Earth which revolves around our common sun and next within the orbit of your Barsoom, which we know as Mars. How I came here I cannot tell you, for I do not know, but here I am, and since my presence has permitted me to serve Deja Thoris, I am glad that I am here. She gazed at me with troubled eyes, long and questioningly. That it was difficult to believe my statement I well know, nor could I hope that she would do so, however much I craved her confidence and respect. I would much rather not have told her anything at all of my antecedents, but no man could look into the depths of those eyes and refuse her slightest request. Finally she smiled and, rising, said, I shall have to believe, even though I cannot understand. 
I can readily perceive that you are not of Barsoom of today. You are like us, yet different. But why should I trouble my poor head with such a problem when my heart tells me that I believe because I wish to believe? It was good, earthly, feminine logic, and if it satisfied her, I certainly could pick no flaws with it. As a matter of fact, it was about the only kind of logic that could be brought to bear upon my problem. We fell into a general conversation then, asking and answering many questions upon each side. She was curious to learn of the customs of my people and displayed a remarkable knowledge of events on earth. When I questioned her closely on this seeming familiarity with earthly things, she laughed and cried out, Why, every schoolboy on Bersoom knows the geography and much concerning the fauna and flora, as well as the history of your planet, fully as well as of his own. Can we not see everything that takes place on earth, as you call it? Is it not hanging there in the heavens in plain sight? This baffled me, I must confess, fully as much as my statements had confounded her, and I told her so. She then explained, in general, the instruments her people had used and been perfecting for ages, which permit them to throw upon the screen a perfect image of what is transpiring upon any planet and upon many of the stars. These pictures are so perfect in detail that, when photographed and enlarged, objects no bigger than a blade of grass may be distinctly recognized. I afterward, in helium, saw many of these pictures as well as the instruments which produced them. If, then, you are so familiar with the earthly things, I asked, why is it that you do not recognize me as identical with the inhabitants of that planet? She smiled again, as one might in bored indulgence of a questioning child. Because, John Carter, she replied, nearly every planet and star having atmospheric conditions at all approaching those of Barsoom shows signs of animal life almost identical with you and me, and further, Earthmen, almost without exception, cover their bodies with strange unsightly pieces of cloth, and their heads with hideous contraptions, the purpose of which we have been unable to conceive, while you, when found by the Tharkian warriors, were entirely undisfigured and unadorned. The fact that you wore no ornaments is strong proof of your unbarsoomian origin, while the absence of grotesque coverings might cause a doubt as to your earthliness. I then explained the details of my departure from Earth, explaining that my body lay there fully clothed in all the, to her, strange garments of mundane dwellers. At this point Sola returned with our meager belongings and her young Martian protege, who of course would have to share the quarters with them. Sola asked us if we had a visitor during her absence, and seemed very much surprised when we answered in the negative. It seemed that as she had mounted the approach to the upper floors where our quarters were located, she had met Sarkocha descending. We decided that she must have been eavesdropping, but as we could recall nothing of importance that had passed between us, we dismissed the matter as of little consequence, merely promising ourselves to be warned to the utmost caution in the future. Deja Thoris and I then fell to examining the architecture and decorations of the beautiful chambers of the building we were occupying. She told me that these people had presumably flourished over a hundred thousand years before. They were the early progenitors of her race, but had mixed with the other great races of the early Martians, who were very dark, almost black, and also with the reddish-yellow race which had flourished at the same time. These three great divisions of the higher Martians had been forced into a mighty alliance as the drying up of the Martian seas had compelled them to seek the comparatively few and always diminishing fertile areas and to defend themselves under new conditions of life against the wild hordes of green men. Ages of close relationship and intermarrying had resulted in the race of red men, of which Dejah Thoris was a fair and beautiful daughter. During the ages of hardships and incessant warring between their own various races, as well as with the green men, and before they had fitted themselves to the changing conditions, much of the high civilization and many of the arts of the fair-haired Martians had become lost. But the red race of today has reached a point where it feels that it is made up in new discoveries and in a more practical civilization for all that lies irretrievably buried with the ancient Barsoomians, beneath the countless intervening ages. Those ancient Martians had been a highly cultivated and literary race, but during the vicissitudes of those trying centuries of readjustment to new conditions, not only did their advancement and production cease entirely, but practically all their archives, records, and literature were lost. Dejah Thoris related many interesting facts and legends concerning this lost race of noble and kindly people. She said that the city in which we were camping was supposed to have been a center of commerce and culture known as Korad. It had been built upon a beautiful natural harbor, landlocked by magnificent hills. The little valley on the west front of the city, she explained, was all that remained of the harbor, 
while the pass through the hills to the old sea bottom had been the channel through which the shipping passed to the city's gates. The shores of the ancient seas were dotted with just such cities, and lesser ones in diminishing numbers were to be found converging toward the center of the oceans, as the people had found it necessary to follow the receding waters until necessity had forced upon them their ultimate salvation, the so-called Martian canals. We had been so engrossed in exploration of the building and in our conversation that it was late in the afternoon before we realized it. We were brought back to a realization of our present situation by a messenger bearing a summons from Lorquas Ptomol, directing me to appear before him forthwith. Bidding Dejah Thoris and Sola farewell, and commanding Wula to remain on guard, I hastened to the audience chamber, where I found Lorquas Ptomol and Tars Tarkas seated upon the rostrum. That's all we have time for tonight, listeners. This broadcast is a production of the Friedrich von Junst Library of Forgotten Worlds with branches in Dusseldorf, Stregoikavar, and Corvallis. To learn more about our extratemporal institution of forgotten learning, please turn to our hub page at von-junst.org. Or if you prefer to visit in person, simply come to Dusseldorf on the clear moonless night rent or purchase a small skiff and silently paddle north on the Rhine until you see the great stone tower rising from its eastern banks. Thank you once again, listeners. Good night, and as always, I wish you Randolph Carterian 